If you want to see your name at the beginning of all of our videos, as well as see exclusive content here on the homestead, please feel free to join our Patreon. Memberships start off at just a dollar a month. And as always, thank you for your support. This answer is in response to a question I posed in that if we are looking for reliable resources when it comes to information on raising rabbits, how and the biggest part of this question I posed is what makes something reliable? Is it that they have a higher education with sources from a college study? Or is it that they agree with the ideology of the person who is commenting? This comment makes me think that it is the latter and that you don't actually want information and facts, you want agreements, you want alignment, you want the same mannerism of speaking. And what's outdated is I honestly thought that schools were teaching students of how to properly source, but that's my bad. With that being said, um, when it comes down to farming and farmers and people raising animals for meat, that doesn't mean that they don't want the best care possible. They want their animals well taken care of. In fact, one of the biggest things other than body condition that we look at when it comes to the appropriate care of our animals is the mental care of our animals through the levels of cortisol that they have. Just because we are eating these guys doesn't mean that we don't want to give them appropriate care. Because rabbits are dual purpose. But originally when they were domesticated thousands of years ago, they were domesticated for meat. I've said it before, I'll say it again, it's only in the past hundred years or so that we have dictated their use for pets. And both purposes are perfectly fine, there's nothing wrong with them. But what is wrong is closing off your mind to sources of information that you don't agree with. You can't say something isn't true just because you agree with it. Otherwise, the sky is purple and you can't convince me otherwise. But the sky is purple because I said so and I don't believe you that the sky is blue. Appropriate care when it comes to farming is a thing. You don't have to like it, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. These are all of the eggs that I just candled and it looks like either didn't form at all or started to form and stopped. So either they have a ring of death and you can see where the formation stopped or their light just went right through them and they looked like little light bulbs. So I'm going to go through, cut these open, and see where they stopped. And this part might get a bit graphic if you want to click off now. If we look at this egg right here, as you can see, it never started to form. It's still a yolk. This guy right here just started to form, as you can see the little embryo there. This is probably less than a week old. This guy's a good bit older, as we can see, we can actually see the embryo, we can see where the blood vessels are coming in to feed off of the egg yolk here. Right here is his little eye, and we can actually see some feather development at this age. But overall, this little quail should be much further along than this. So this one right here is slightly further uh, along, the eye is smaller, and we're seeing even more feathers but this is still too far off from where they should be at about hatching time. So unfortunately, I don't have any more eggs that are further developed as of yet. If y'all want to see more development in the embryos that don't hatch, you're going to have to hang around for about four to five more days. When I start breaking into the eggs here in lockdown, that didn't hatch out. I find when it comes to the day-old chick sales, it's mostly for people who want to have them for their own eggs. And if they are looking at butchering them themselves, then a lot of times what they'll do is they'll get them to raise them and produce eggs on their own. Most of my repeat customers when it comes to the day-old chicks are people who are looking to replace older hens or looking to diversify the chicks that they got from me from a previous year. So for instance, if they got a bunch of jumbo whites last year, maybe this year they want a bunch of jumbo browns. Or if I have a different rooster from where they got their last eggs last year, they're looking for a different rooster's babies. There is a lot of space on the market if you're well willing to sell eating eggs and you're willing to process the quail yourself and sell the meat under certain licensing. And each state has their own regulations on how you can do that. 
as well as how many you would need to sell before you get your licensing. That's going to depend on how many eggs you want. For instance, we always say that three eggs is equivalent to one chicken egg. So if you want three eggs a day, I suggest starting with nine hens. But just like chicken math, there is also quail math. Because even though you start out with nine hens trying to get nine eggs, not everyone is going to lay every single day. Most of the time they do, but sometimes they don't. So you decide you're going to get 12 quail. Just to make up just in case one of your hens doesn't lay or multiple of your hens doesn't lay. And then you might decide that you want to do hatching eggs and start hatching your own quail. Because a quail dinner every once in a while is delicious. So for every five hens, you're going to want one rooster. And you're going to want enough hatching eggs, but still be able to have enough eggs to eat. So you're going to double your amount of hens, making it 24. And that is how I ended up with 50 quail. So to start off with, if you just want to do a breeding clutch, one roo, and five hens, that's definitely enough to start with to try it out. But it can get out of hand very quickly. Why can't we let our rabbits just die naturally? I have a couple of answers for this. For one, we wouldn't be able to use the animal. We raise rabbits as a livestock animal, meaning we eat them. And we try to use every single part of the rabbit. When it comes down to it, if we would let the animal die out naturally, we wouldn't be able to use every single part of the animal. Just like if you were to have a cow or a pig or a chicken, that animal would no longer be viable the meat would spoil. So it would be disrespectful to that animal to waste their carcass. Instead, we pick the time, we pick the date, and we humanely cull them out. I prefer a cervical dislocation method, and then we butcher them out and use every single part we can. The other reason, because these are livestock animal, it's not monetarily efficient. So if I have a doe who is five years old, no longer producing litters, she is no longer attributing to the program. And speaking from a monetary standpoint, it's not efficient to have 20 animals who are no longer producing babies for our meat program. And at the end of the day, whether someone agree with me or not, my main goal is to feed my family. My family is more important than these animals. So if they are no longer attributing to my program, we're going to call them out and eat them. And again, that is just like any other program that raises animals for meat. A great example is the dairy industry. When a cow is no longer producing babies and milk, she goes to a program and becomes ground beef because that is where she can best produce for the program. If you are failing at hatching eggs, I have a few questions for you. Do you have a secondary temperature gauge that regulates humidity as well? So not only should you have the temperature gauge on top, this one should be in the bottom of your incubator, preferably in a back corner. That way you can monitor the temperature and the humidity all over the incubator. One of the biggest problems when it comes to hatch rates is when you don't have the right temperature or the right humidity. If you do have this, what are you keeping your temperature at? Is it fluctuating? And what are you keeping your humidity at? The less those numbers move, the better. But the lowest your hatch rate should be is 50%. And preferably, we would like to move that number closer to 80%. What I do to make sure my temperature is regulated is not only having those two temperature gauges, but I check them at least four times a day. Keep your incubator in kind of a corner where the temperature doesn't change much away from drafts. Again, consistency is key when it comes to hatching eggs. A quick hindhold feed update. 
We have been on the feed for about three weeks. We are 100% on the feed for the rabbitry. And I was feeding about 10 ounces a day to my rabbits that were commercial size, being around 10 pounds. And I have upped that to 12 ounces. I was losing condition in a lot of my does and that's not something I'm really interested in. So now instead of doing a half cup in the morning, half cup in the night, we're doing about three quarters of a cup in the morning and three quarters of a cup at night, which is fine. I can attribute a lot of that t condition loss to our weather, but I would rather up the feed just a bit beyond what they recommend, which is one ounce per pound of rabbit just to ensure that these guys stay at a great condition. And the way I monitor my condition is through weighing the rabbits themselves and then also running my hand over their backs. And most of them I could feel where they were getting a little thin running my hands over them. So again, I just upped the amount they were eating. They haven't been on it long enough for me to say that it is worth it or not. I just figured y'all would really like an update. I always find it interesting how many comments I get like these, wherein people aren't necessarily farmers or they don't have specific animals, and they will make a comment along the lines of, oh, well, XYZ gets treated better than one, two, three. So in this case, I've seen cows get treated better than these rabbits but you aren't a cow farmer. And from the sound of it, you yourself don't care for these cows either. So you just drive past them in a pretty little field, which I love a good scenic drive, don't get me wrong. But oftentimes we'll get comments that have no idea what goes on when it comes to farming in general, be it for larger or smaller animals. Rabbits need a very specific kind of care, especially when being raised for meat. Yes, they are a domesticated species, but they are still prey animals. They are prone to being scared and flighty, which makes them more likely to have things like heart attack or to break their backs. Although you would never guess that to be true, seeing how like calm Zeus is and how he just kind of wants attentions. So the reason why we have nice small cages is they are safe for the animal. It mimics a den or a cave like the warrens these rabbits would have based on their European wild counterparts. We use wire flooring because it's the most hygienic option. It's dry, it's clean, and these rabbits are specifically bred for wire living. They have nice thick fur coverings over their feet. These rabbits don't have paw pads like we would see in a cat or a dog. And also, we do provide entertainment for these guys if Zeus would quit laying on them. He has a pine cone he's nearly demolished and a bell ball. They also get various kinds of chews and hay. These guys get species-appropriate care. But at the end of the day, these are livestock and not pets. If you are asking how to get my quail, odds are you're going to have to be close to me in the Colorado Springs area. Now, if you're asking about in general, there are a couple of options. If you want hatching eggs, there are a ton of different places that sell hatching eggs, Katornik's Corner being one of them. If you are looking for live birds, like day-old chicks or older birds, check out Meyer Hatchery. They're starting to sell day-old chicks. Meyer Hatchery is what I used to get all of my meat chickens and some of my specialty orders. They have great customer service and they always send me extras, which I'm very grateful for when it comes to my percentiles. Now, if you're not interested in any of those options, there's always the Craigslist option or the Facebook option. Basically, you're going to look up quail for sale in your area and you'll meet someone and see if you can pick up some quail. But if you are meeting some a random person from the internet, you aren't going to guarantee the quality and if they are disease-free in most cases. 
So be very, very careful when meeting people off of Craigslist and Facebook, because sometimes it can be just a bit sketchy. The only kind of quail I raise are Katornix quail. This is my silver pen. It's a very aggressive pen. If you look at this hen right here, if you look at the back of her head, it's kind of been plucked bare. She is a favorite of my rooster. And these guys like to fight each other a lot, no matter the numbers I have. But the general rule of thumb is one square foot per bird. With my normal Katornix quail, I stick by that. With my silvers, I slightly overpack them so they don't pick on just one bird quite as much. And I ratio them heavier on the hen side compared to the rooster side. Also, I don't use a silver roux. I use a jumbo brown roux and a jumbo white roux. Just because of how big they are, they're able to handle the hens. Because again, these silvers are very mean compared to my other pens. So the way my breeding program works is if I'm breeding something to my broken black, which is strawberry, we aren't focused on color, we are focused on type. Strawberry's lineage is very predictable in that the only thing he has really in his lines that you see on his pedigree are blacks and broken blacks all the way back. So if I am breeding him to something more recessive, I am going to get those black-based colors coming out. Meaning if I want this pretty little lilac agouti color, this lynx color, I would have to take a baby out of the initial pairing of my broken black and lynx and breed it back to Lulu, my lynx, to once again get that color. Which is why we've been attempting to get a litter out of her and my lilac otterbuck. I'm trying to retain that very recessive chocolate color. When it comes to my ring colors, however, what I'll do is if I want to improve ring colors and to make them a little less muddy, I will either breed lynx to lynx, or I will breed lynx to amber, or I will breed lynx to caster. Again, preferably to keep that chocolate variant going, I would want to breed her to an amber or a lynx to clean up these lines. But overall, Lulu has a very nice split on her ring color, and really all I'm trying to duplicate is her.